So off we go, Lizzie and Alex. How are you? Yeah, very good, thank you. Thank How you for it? having us. We're yeah. excited to be here. So as I just mentioned, there are very limited rules in this conversation. So uh, uh, you can do whatever you want. I, I think I will Brilliant. be fine with it. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, I like to warm up uh, conversations with some quirky personal questions so that the audience gets to know a little bit uh, who uh, you are. And so <laughs> Sounds good. since you're there's two of you, I'm going to start with a question to you both. And that is, what do you think is the biggest difference between you two? Apart from our anatomy. <clears throat> Apart from <laughs> the anatomy, yeah. yeah. Because I think, honestly, I think that, that we are quite pretty similar. Um, but, uh, you know, I think- I think we're really that... different. That's a good, we can think... talk about uh, this for the whole well... podcast. All right, you, you start then. <laughs> well, no, I just think one of the things that we talk about is cognitive diversity. And I think though Alex and I are really united as a team, we often have like differing perspectives on things. But I think probably the biggest difference between us is that whenever we eat together, Alex will always choose the meat option and I will always choose the veggie option. You can guarantee it. Okay. Uh, that's, <laughs> probably, that's absolutely true. true. It is absolutely is, true. It, it is absolutely true. Um, yeah. You're, I mean, a, you're a countryside dweller. I'm a city dweller. You see, there are... Yeah, that's systems. true. Yeah, 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 that's true. That's true. <laughs> yeah, and, and perhaps... Uh, yeah, we are. I think we share a lot of values, which is which is great, uh, and we have a kind of shared vision. Um, but um, but I think, as Lizzie says, we we do come at things from a different perspective, um, and I think I think uh, me being a guy bring make you know with a different background, completely different background to Lizzie, uh, make, makes a difference actually. Um, and we bring kind of, I think, cognitive diversity, as Lizzie talked about, uh, as a result of that. Uh, I think that yeah, I, I, I noted that down. Maybe for our listeners, mm. what the yeah. hell is cognitive diversity? <laughs> 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 Basically, uh, looking at the diversity uh, of people in terms of the way they think, rather than the way they look or where they live or what, how they grew up, or what their background was. It's, it's it's actually <clears throat> the sum of all of those things influences our brain patterns and the way we approach problems and the way we think about things and 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 really that's what we are really excited about in terms of uniting people uh, in the delivery of work is being mm -hmm. able to bring cognitively diverse people together is what creates more uh, more interesting deeper solutions than bringing together people who generally think in the same way which is i guess you could think of it as groupthink. so mm. having uh cognitive diversity uh, increases the intelligence of a group um and yeah that's kind of the opposite of having uh groupthink or homogenous people working together what's the state of the average workplace in terms of cognitive diversity I mean, I don't think there's master data to know that, but I think you can pretty quickly tell by being in an organization, whether it's a culture of people who think the same way or whether it's a culture of diversity. And I guess part of what we've tried to do, and I don't wanna jump ahead with Hoxby is kind of create this experimental playground to test cognitive diversity and diversity in all its forms by redefining work to make it accessible to everyone. Mm -hmm. But I appreciate we've completely derailed. You said anything going, yeah. we've completely it's, derailed your, your no, question. No worries. <laughs> I told you. I think <laughs> limited I, rules. I think um, it's important. We, we try not to conflate cognitive diversity with diversity in its broadest sense. But mm. the reality is that cognitive diversity can be seen in difference. So you, what you're looking for is people who are different from one another. And that does manifest in organisations that are more culturally and ethnically diverse as much as cognitively diverse as well so mm -hmm. in those organizations where you witness diversity you're more likely to get cognitive diversity as well okay okay can't wait to jump into the hogsby topic but let's 
let's let's let's first ask Lizzie. Um, when you think of Alex's family, um, what's the first image that comes to mind? Um, your quintessentially perfect family of four skipping yeah. through a field of corn in the countryside. Mm -hmm. um, that's the image that I have. And that's Amazing. because when Alex talks to me about his kids, he, Alex and I are both deep thinkers. Uh, maybe you have to be to come up with a concept like work style and start a business like Hoxby and maybe to write a book. But, um, and Alex always really thinks about his parenting stuff. I learn a lot from Alex about life and parenting as well as about work, so. Okay. It's, it's, it's such a lovely image, the fact that we might be skipping through cornfields. I mean, does that happen? The, that... It, it, uh, unfortunately not, Regular. no, but I'm going to no. make sure okay. that it does at some point okay. to make that a right. reality Thanks. because yeah. I think life with two small children is challenging and Lizzie's got three, so she she knows uh, her wow. experience worse than me. But yeah. So three um, kids, two companies, a book. There are super, super women out there. Uh, I am not one, one of them. Absolutely. Let me tell <laughs> you, Nick, one of them. I am not one of them. No, no, I am muddling through is how I'm how I'm getting by. Muddling mm, through. But slowly but surely muddling also brings you a long way, right? Exactly. Um, like, don't think about it all in one go. Just take it one week at a time. Exactly. Um, Alex, last one for you. Um, what are the top three qualities that you appreciate in Lizzie? Um, I think I sort of touched on this, I think, perhaps a little bit before in that we have a lot of shared values, um, which is helpful when you're working together every day and starting businesses and writing books with people. Um, but Lizzie also has qualities that mean that that is a pleasure in the way that we actually work. So I think probably three would be, uh, firstly, integrity so lizzie is incredibly um genuine in all that she does and that makes our openness and transparency and ability to to work together just a joy so much easier mm -hmm. uh i think the the second thing would be humor because you need it when you have a family uh but also when you have two businesses and a book uh you have to be able to see the funny side of everything that you know the challenges that come along and there are many mm -hmm. uh and so that's a that's been a, a real quality of lizzie's over the years but i think probably the biggest one is her fire and her passion for creating change which just drives us every single day no matter what's going on and um yeah we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that so yeah i'm very grateful to her for that Particularly I'm loving this wow. loving this podcast but, so far Nick. this is yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah just take it in let's let's take yeah, some I'm like, 10, I knew 10 15 that seconds at just to just laughing take it at in. alex's jokes was gonna be in there somewhere when he says humor he means i appreciate his dad jokes and his partner <laughs> <so>. <laughs> yeah that will get you everywhere <laughs> so yeah it's, it's obviously that you that you know each other quite well and that you enjoy each other's company and working together so maybe this is a, a good moment to explain what it is exactly that you do together. So you mentioned Hogsby. Uh, maybe share the origin story yeah. of Hogsby with us. Sure. <clears throat> um, well, we should probably say that Hogsby um, is a business that we started in 2015, but we started off the back of having an idea to change the way the world works. Um, it's an idea that we came up with in the pub, must must admit. Um, mm -hmm. But the idea, the idea is the word work style. And it's an idea that united us, um, given our personal situations at the time, which, which we can come on to, to talk about. But really work style is a word we created to give everybody a way of defining when and where they work for themselves. So rather than assuming that we all work Monday to Friday, nine to five, assuming that we each have our own individual work style, and that enables us to fit our work around our life, whatever is going on at that time, because life changes, every life is different. And we believe that everybody should be able to have 
a work style of their own. So we came up with the word work style um, and Hoxby was the business that we started in 2015 to prove that work style can work and ultimately replace the nine to five office based regime in which work has been done for more than 200 years. So that was in 2015, you say? Yes. Okay. Yes. And then maybe, maybe um, Lizzie, where, where are we today with Hogs? Yeah, so that was a lot's changed since then. So when we started working in a work style way, people thought we were a bit weird. Um, a few people joined us really early, and they were the people who had their own burning platform. And as Alex alluded to, we each had our own reasons. Alex had been through burnout. I had a young family um, for wanting to work this way. But at the time, we weren't looking for an organisation that worked this way and couldn't find one. And that's why we started Hoxby. And since then, with the pandemic, everything's changed. Um, at the start of the pandemic, we decided to try and open source how we worked so that everyone could work this way, which is what we campaign for after all. Um, and that turned into the book. Um, so we've written a book called Work Style. But that was on the basis that this went from being something that a small minority did to suddenly being thrust into the mainstream. And I think now we're at kind of the next stage beyond that, where organisations are starting to think the pandemic's over, we can go back to the office. But actually, there are a lot of people that are saying, I am not willing to just go back to the way it was before. We've tested this like way of working that's fit for the digital era. And so we're not willing to go back. So I think the conversation is particularly fascinating at the moment because there's this tension between organisations, particularly traditional ones that want people back in the office and individuals that know there must be a better way. And for those people, work style is the answer. Okay. And what is, is, what is it exactly that Hogsby does? What kind of services do you provide to customers? Yeah, I was I was just thinking that might be useful to explain. So <laughs> since 2015, uh, when we started Hogsby, uh, the work that we've done has been predominantly in uh, creative, coming up with ideas and communications. So uh, communicating those ideas through our um, press office and design studio services. So it's been largely contained within that space. And we've done projects for companies like Unilever, Amazon, AIA, Merck, Divine, B-Lab. So a range of companies, large and small, but but increasingly with a, a focus on having a positive impact through the, the work that those brands do. Um, but as Lizzie said, over the last uh, few years, interest has really gone up in our way of working and the concept of work style in being able to help organisations navigate this <clears throat> post-pandemic challenge uh, uh, and disconnect between organization and, and people. So we wrote the book during the pandemic and it launched at the back end of uh, last year, 2022, uh, and has be since become a Sunday Times bestseller here in the UK. And really the, the thing that that's meant is that Hoxby now also shares everything it's learnt about autonomous working and working in a work style way with our clients. So we're doing that to help their people to, to work and to lead and to learn in, a, in an autonomous way. And also for those organizations to adopt some of the cultural principles that are necessary to enable people to maximize their, their work when not tied to a, an office uh, from nine to five. Okay. Well, I guess most of us and people listening, they get the benefits of uh, work style so I, i'd like to zoom in on what are the, the 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 challenges and maybe even the disadvantages of uh this new way of working so i think um as we said hoxby was a big experiment and um, we've always been open about that we've made loads of mistakes we've learned loads from those mistakes and we'll continue so, to make so them sorry to interrupt lizzie Is, yeah um, first hoxby in numbers so how many people about 500, it's a community of about 500 people. Okay, so um, it's a community business, so customers contact you, yeah. Yes, okay. and it's a freelance community. 
So it might be that Unilever get in touch with a project. We will then take that project, break it into its constituent outputs that need to ladder up to the whole and bring together a team. So we curate a team to deliver that. Okay. And each of those individuals work in their own work style. But Hoxby is accountable for the output. Hoxby is the one that works with the ultimate client to deliver the design work, the PR and comms work, the, mm -hmm. the creative campaign, whatever it might be. Okay, so, so that's because Alex and my background was in marketing. And so that's why we started working there. Okay, so within the let's let's take that as a context, right? So you you you're in the context of a project uh, between two companies, you assemble a team. What are the disadvantages of every member in that team working according to their work style? So we think there are mostly advantages. I think that Obviously. rather than disadvantages, I would frame it as what are the challenges of making this way of work work? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of it is about culture and mindset and unlearning corporate behaviors or unlearning the way we've been working for the last 200 years. So the nine to five working day was first conceived of in the industrial revolution more than 200 years ago. The five day working week is a hundred years old. These are things that are completely ingrained in all of our minds and still in many organizations. So with WorkStyle, we early on recognize that you need to be digital first, asynchronous and trust-based. And those three things are challenges for lots of individuals and organizations. Truly being digital first and communicating on a digital first basis is, is difficult for many established organizations to do as is working asynchronously. I think a lot of people think that, oh, we can move to asynchronous, but I don't think they truly commit to being asynchronous in the same way that, that Hotspur does as the kind of prototype for this way of working. And then the final thing is that being trust-based, which is something that just doesn't happen by itself. Um, you need to role model it, you need to recognize and reward it within an organization in order to really create that trust-based culture. So I think those are three really important things. The other thing that we're really regularly asked about is people say, well, how can you possibly build deep connections with people if you're not physically in the same place? And at Hotsby, we don't have an office. Slack is our office, but we do have meetups. People do meet up. Every week there's a meetup happening somewhere. And once a year we have a big everyone get together meetup. So we do see the value in physical connection, um, but we just don't think it's the best way to get work done. It's not the most productive way. It's not the best for our well-being. And so for us, that is another mindset shift that needs to happen, that connection ha can happen in real life and should happen in real life, but not to get work done, to build relationships and bonds with people. I think, um, talk about challenges, that those three things that Lizzie's talked about, digital first, asynchronous and trust-based, replace 200 years of psychological conditioning to a way of work that is physical first synchronous and presence based so the challenge is getting people to make that shift of mindset that Lizzie talked about from away from the industrial age norms of work where you had to be somewhere within a certain time working together at the same time into we work together mostly in a digital space not at the same time and we trust each other to do that and mm -hmm. that's a very different set of behaviors for people to learn uh but why the culture and and the conditions that you that you create for that to happen are so important and mm. but this is this is this is the challenge so but also the opportunity what, what you're saying also a little, if i read between the lines is that it takes time i think it takes really strong leadership and I don't necessarily mean leadership from the top of a structured organization this is our bosses after all I mean leadership from individuals who have a desire to make this work to prove that it works so anyone in an organization can be a leader of, of this way of working I don't necessarily mm. think it takes a lot of time if there's big commitment from an organization to do it but I do think you have to invest time energy money in taking getting people out of that old mindset that Alex was talking about into that new mindset. 
Because we, you know, we've done this from the start. We were doing this in 2015 when, you know, this hasn't been done mm. before. So it can it can be done. It's just that lots of organizations have a lot of baggage they need to let go of first. What's your opinion on the the minimal rules that have to be in place um in order for in order for this to 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 work to the benefit of of everyone in the team are there any rules and and the reason i'm asking this is because a lot of companies indeed struggle with um office work homework and then if they don't give any indication uh like two days or three days a week we want you to like to to be in the office so we can create an office culture um so yeah if 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 those rules are not there it tends mm -hmm. to become very difficult and unclear like who who's working where um so what what's your opinion on that um i ha i have an opinion on that um <clears throat> which is that i think in a trust based way of working uh and <clears throat> excuse me where people are able to choose when and where they work for themselves. They have a great deal of autonomy, but with that has to come accountability for output. So everybody who's working in a work style way knows what they have to deliver and they, they understand their accountability to that thing rather than their accountability to be present during office hours. So that is fundamentally different. I think when you have that and you can kind of unlock the autonomy of people, you get the benefit at a team level of deciding the, the rules of engagement. This, this isn't something that should be necessarily a mandate, a top down, this is, these are the rules, but more a mutual agreement that's set out at the start that says, Work style is sacrosanct, right? So we're all going to have our own work style. We understand each other to a level of uh, that enables us to collaborate. We understand when we're working, when we're not working. We're going to be digital first, asynchronous and trust-based because that's how things are. So let's set out what are our rules of engagement that are going to help us get from where we are now to where we need to be. Um, and, and really that's about empowerment at a team level, mm -hmm. as I say, rather than a blanket mandate because really anything that's a kind of one size fits all approach to anything isn't going to work for everyone. So mm. we're about individualizing yeah. work and enabling the decision-making and empowering autonomy at the point at which the work is being done. Yeah. And maybe even not inventing the rules up front, but or letting them it's, organically come the agreements yeah. based on actual situations that you encounter and you think, oh, we can improve this. Exactly. Um, I, yeah, I would, I would, I think that's absolutely right, Nick. Like, um, maybe we can share the details in the show notes, but we have um, a, created a community, a work style revolution community of people who've read the book and want to implement work style to a greater or lesser extent, either for themselves or for their organizations where people can come together and share what they're doing and how it's working and questions they have. And really for us, that's fascinating because we spent the last eight years doing this ourselves in Hoxby, but that's an organization created with this in mind. And it's really only since the book that we're now seeing work style applied to different organizations. And so I think we aren't in a position to say these are the rules. We're learning all the time from organizations now adopting the work style mentality and we're seeing what works for them what doesn't work and how we can exactly. continuously improve there's, it. There's no universal truth neither. And it depends on what is needed for, yeah. for what a team needs. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, are there businesses, industries, workplaces where it's more difficult to define the output of work? So if the, the key, the key is, you don't need to control. You don't need to tell people what to do. They can choose it by themselves because they're accountable for output. And accountable is something objective. You can measure. And if someone structurally doesn't meet uh, the output expected, you can have a, 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 a discussion with them. Uh, so I'm wondering, 
is it possible to define output in every type of work? So we we say, is, as you've said, autonomy and accountability go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. So you can't give everyone autonomy without also making sure that they're accountable for delivering the output that they're engaged to deliver. That is absolutely critical. And that is a mindset shift for a lot of people, particularly organizations where people have previously been based on time, being at their desk for their seven and a half hours a week or whatever it might be. There are certainly um, industries where work style is a real natural fit. So for instance, the knowledge economy, you know, there are around a billion knowledge workers around the world. That is a really natural fit. People tend to completely understand how you can apply work style there. Then there are other areas where it's arguably more challenging. Frontline workers, um, first responders, healthcare workers, um, where, where it is place-based working. And so for those organizations and those individuals, we always say that we believe that work style is a mentality. It's not just a structure of work. It's an attitude to work where you value individual differences and you recognize an individual's contribution. So for us, it's about looking critically at the output that is delivered. So some of it will be place-based, but everyone has some work to do that actually isn't place-based. It's the admin that goes with their job, for instance. So I think for us, that is the mindset shift. It's thinking mm -hmm. in terms of output rather than time. And for some people that comes really naturally and for some organizations, they already do that. And for others, mm -hmm. that is a long way from where they are now. Okay. And with regards to output, uh, another follow-up question. Mm, how will I put this? So there's quite some research done that actually individual target setting is less effective than team target setting. So instead of giving everyone an individual goal, you give a team a goal um, and, and everyone tries to contribute to achieving the goal. So um, I understand why you link output to the individual. Um, how do I link this with, how do you prevent that it becomes a very internal individualistic competitive environment, which tends to happen according to research when you, for example, work with individual bonuses. Um, so yeah, how, how do you, how, how, do, how do I have to see work style in that, in that dilemma? I mean, I would say three ways. So firstly, we have a team charter at the start of every project. So whilst everyone knows what they need to contribute, they also understand what everyone else in the team is contributing and what the ultimate outcome needs mm -hmm. to be. Um, the second thing is that at Hoxby, we have a really clear vision. So we exist to create a happier, more fulfilled society through a world of work without bias. That's been our vision from the start. Everyone who joins knows that and in the application process we need to know they're aligned to that for them to join so mm -hmm. we also have this kind of bigger uniting goal that brings everyone together and then the third thing is that at Hoxby 25% of the profits are shared equally between the community regardless of how many projects you've worked on how much money you've earned what you've outputted 25% of the profits are shared equally between everyone so we we have recognized what you're talking about and we have experimented and put in place mechanics to make sure that everyone is linked to the ultimate success of Hoxby overall, the output of their project, and also to playing their part in the individual um, output mm -hmm. for which they're accountable. Yeah. So you're creating a lot of clarity is what I hear. The team yeah. charter on what the team needs to achieve. And then the individual output is basically clarity on the individual expectations, the, the roles that you're picking up. And then I hear you say, uh, we give people a sense of meaning with the vision and a sense of yeah. impact. And then uh, lastly, um, they get a they share collectively in the rewards that the team have, ha have made. So I, I, it makes me think of the five dynamics of effective teams that was one shared with uh, from the, the Google research, right? Clarity, um, uh, impact, meaning. Okay. Okay, thank you. Is there anything you'd like to add, uh, Alex, before I segue to, and Lizzie already mentioned it, the application uh, process at Hogsby? Um No, I don't think so. I mean, I think Lizzie's answered um, the question brilliantly. I think 
probably the only thing I would say is that um, we're talking in very hypothetical terms at the moment in terms of how the business works. I think sometimes when we're talking about businesses and the way they're structured and how they're going to how people are going to collaborate, we forget about the fact that there are people involved and people are incredibly talented and can be trusted to do great work and can be trusted to figure out between them how they're going to get to a great output and can be trusted to look after their own work styles and, you know, manage that around whatever else they've got going on in life. I think sometimes we forget that people have a power to, to, a, to a process or a methodology, and that's never truer than in this sense. You can give people, just create uh, the conditions for them to, to flourish as a team and also individually because they actually really enjoy it. You get mm -hmm. a lot out of it. Uh, of, of working together towards something brilliant and doing it under their own steam. So I think it's important that we don't lose sight of that. Amen. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you think, you, you think that's a core belief one needs to have if one wants to go on the adventure of work style? What faith in, in humanity. Yeah. That yeah. Mo most people are Probably. good. Yeah. I think so. I think so. In the book, we talk about, I was talking to someone at a conference um, and he just couldn't fathom how we work with people we've never met, how we could trust people that we've never met. And I think that showed me that there are, there are two groups of people. There are people who have faith in human nature, swift trust, and then earned trust. And there are people who don't, who think, if I can't see you sitting on a chair, I don't believe that you're working. And there's a lot around kind of AI and tracking um, of people working from home that's become a whole, you know, industry where I think I I can't think those organizations will ever adopt autonomous working or not in the short term. And I think they'll lose competitive advantage as a result because mm. the best talent won't go and work for those organizations. We know mm. that autonomy at work is better for a whole host of things. Um, and it also attracts the best talent. It brings out the best in people. So I think that there's a there's a competitive advantage element here. The organisations that that don't have that faith in humanity will miss out because they just won't adopt this way of working that could bring them, you know, better success. Yep, totally agree with that. Um, so let's segue to talent acquisition. This is a very important topic for many organizations um, to acquire a talent and the challenge to acquire the right talent. And you guys have quite a unique approach to that, definitely because you, you're not basing yourselves on typical criteria like lo location or, or other uh, typical employment cr criteria. So could you maybe explain your talent acquisition approach um, and if possible, include some of the benefits? Yeah. Well, I think one of the first things when we came up with the idea of work style uh, back in 2015, we realized that, OK, so if we if anybody can work anywhere and at any time, how do we how do we make that? Uh, how do you sort of contain that? What, what is that if it's uh, if it's not a traditionally structured hierarchy of employees? What is it? And we started out with a hypothesis that this could be a community rather than a corporation so thinking about it as a group of people with a common purpose uh but not necessarily structured in a pyramid or, or any other shape necessarily but that these are just talented people anywhere in the world uh who are free to decide what work they do uh when they do it and we need to just be the destination of choice for those people. Um, we need to create the conditions, the environment, the culture, the, the sort of intangible elements that replace bricks and mortar and shared office hours. So it's it's a, a community model, therefore, of freelancers. So everybody within Hoxby is self-employed and able to take on projects outside of Hoxby as well as inside of Hoxby. But what that enables is for us to treat everybody within the community um, equally. They all have their own work style, but it also gives us an, an enormous talent pool from which to curate teams, as Lizzie talked about, in the delivery of work. So 
people come into Hoxby uh, on the basis of cultural fit and of wanting to create a happier, more fulfilled society through a world of work without bias. And really, then it's on us to understand what they're great at, what they can bring to any team such that when a brief comes in, we can curate the, the right team for that brief. And that might be because they have uh, the right skills, uh, might be that they are they have uh, complementary work styles, that they have a particular passion for the industry that that client works in, or that they are collectively more intelligent because of their cognitive diversity. So we can start thinking about really interesting ways in which to assemble teams of people that that is unconstrained by traditional employment, i.e., we can we we've got this many people that we can afford within our headcount budget, and they are also the people that can make it to the office because they live within a commutable distance. This is a limitless talent pool, globally distributed, highly diverse, and therefore very, very powerful when it comes to then putting together teams to deliver projects. Okay. So how, that's a complete... How, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So many I was just follow say, questions. It's, 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 it's a very <laughs> different approach to talent acquisition in that we're yeah. not yeah. saying, here's a job, let's go find someone who can fit it. It's yeah. about saying we're a community who will believe in the same thing. Come and join us if you also believe in that. And when the right project comes along for all the skills you've got, then we'll bring you into that project. It's a completely different uh, take on it, as you as you rightly say. It also isn't talent that we acquire. So our, you know, people yeah. are talent. They are humans, and acquisition yeah. implies you kind of own them in some way. Whereas you know, yeah. at Hoxby, you're part of a community because you choose to be, and you choose how much work you do through Hoxby. Um, the actual application process, in terms of specifics, the actual application process is basically um, a task to test how connected you are to the vision, work style, and the world that we're trying to create. So it's quite creative in that sense. It doesn't have to be, you know, um, but you could you can approach that as like a poem or, you know, um, a photography project or whatever, however you want to express it. What we're looking for is to bring people together who believe in this different future of work. But I think the other thing that's worth mentioning is when we curate teams, we don't just do it based on previous experiences. We do it on skills, passions, and circumstances. So lots of organizations would say, you've got experience, Lizzie, working in drinks marketing. So that's what you need to do. Well, actually I have lived experience of lots of other things that are really valuable that make me perfect to work in work staff, for example, even though yeah. my CV <laughs> might not look like it. So I think that for us, it's about, yes, it's about the skills that you have, but it's also about what are the things that you have a lifelong passion for? Because actually you've probably acquired a hell of a lot of knowledge if you're really passionate about something. Um, and second, and thirdly, your circumstances. So your circumstances around you might mean you can empathize with different problems, bring a different perspective, but also they'll dictate your availability to work on a larger or smaller part of a project. Okay. There's a lot, there's a lot is, there. Is there, is there, is, is, yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. Uh, is there, do you have a system uh, to to well keep all the, 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 the to log all the data and then to curate the teams? Is that something yeah, so that you you've built yourself or uh, we built you... it ourselves? It's a tagging system, so people tag themselves for the things they want to be known for, and I think that's really interesting as well because you might your background might be as a graphic designer, but you might also want to be learning about photography, so you might have. Um, a different output charge for when you're working as a designer versus photography, which is something you want to break into. So one person can be many things within Hoxby because they have the power to choose what they tag themselves with. Well, in the My one Hoxby person system. is many things and within exactly. Hoxby, they, can, they remain to be many things. Exactly. How important do you feel it is that, so it says something about someone that they're self-employed. So on the self-employment, and that means that there is already a natural accountability. However, I feel like everyone has this natural accountability, but the fact that they're self-employed. So how, how important of a role in the Hogsby model uh, or community is the self-employment fact? That's the first question. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to add immediately a second question. Do you guys envision in 50 years that everyone would be self-employed? Yes, definitely. 
Um, and to, to come back to part one, I think it's integral to the model. And it comes a bit back to what Lizzie was saying about acquisition and this sense of ownership. Traditional employment creates a power dynamic of an employee is effectively owned by the company. They are the company's property during the time in which they're there. And that doesn't set a healthy basis for a relationship, actually, in our opinion. Whereas if we think of um, not owning talent, not seeking to acquire it for ourselves, but to simply uh, borrow it you, and, and create brilliant conditions for, for, for people to thrive in the work that they do, then that's much more what we think the organisation of the future is. And that enables people to choose the companies they work with. So they have talent, as we've talked about, lots of different areas of competence, things they want to do, passions they want to explore, and they can choose how they do that. Mm -hmm. But that's a completely different mindset shift from being owned by an employer to recognizing that actually the power is in you, the individual, to not only set and project your own work style, define that for yourself, but also choose the projects you work on, do things that get the most out of your energy, your enthusiasm, your passions. And <clears throat> that shift of power from uh, kind of employer ownership to individual individual uh, individualism uh, and the strength of each person requires people to transition from employment to self-employment, whether that happens through kind of policy or, or change to uh, legal process remains to be seen. But certainly from a mindset point of view and a behaviours point of view, that's what we're trying to encourage through the work that we do uh, at the Workstyle Revolution and within Hogsby. And Lizzie, I saw two thumbs up when you when I said in 50 years, yeah. everyone's self-employed. We rarely talk about this. And I think it's something Alex and I have talked about a lot, but we don't go into it too much in the book. But we believe in a future, as Alex says, that is communities, not corporations, where people can be part of many organisations and where it's a bit of a power to the people thing as well that you get to choose where you want to give the benefit of your experience and, and skills and passions to and so I think we see um, already there are some organizations that have lots of organizations that have full-time or em employed part of their workforce and then a kind of contingent workforce at some point in, in some kind of manifestation but that contingent workforce is very much seen, you know, freelancers, this is one of the things we campaign for with the Works of Revolution, that freelancers are seen as a contingent workforce. Just bring them in only when you need them rather than understanding that they are exceptionally valuable. And many businesses, you know, they're a real source of advantage and value. And so for us, we expect that to shift over time. There'll be less and less employed people and more and more people who are part of these communities. And those communities will be seen as strategic and valuable in a way they haven't been before. Okay, clear, uh, and I, we share we share a similar vision. Um, I'm gonna start to wrap up the conversation. I would like to know: Can you give an example of an organization other than Hoxby who's adopting uh, the work style mindset um, that you know of? Maybe you can't mention the name. That's fine, but just. Give me a, a brief sketch of the organization and, and how they're adopting uh, work style successfully. Yeah, um, we are working with a few organizations, but as you already say, we can't talk specifically about who they are. Um, we're working with one firm who are a uh, tech led research company. So they are inherently um, digitally first in the way they do things they have a large portion of the workforce that is in kind of the development side of things and so as a result their ways of working are kind of naturally digital digital first um and they've been working that way for a while uh but but what uh th they are kind of globally distributed as well they are they're across multiple markets and what they're doing is implementing work style for the benefit of Im improved culture so they're creating work style documents whereby each person is writing down 
what their work style is and why. And that's helping them to get to know one another at a, to a deeper level beyond the kind of superficial level that most kind of working relationships tend to exist at, which is helping them to work better as teams. It's improving the quality of their work and it's improving the level of engagement that they see among the workforce, but which is which is important when that workforce is made up of quite different personality types uh, being tech led. And so that's something that we're ex we're seeing firsthand at the moment is that kind of tangible gain from thinking and talking in terms of work style. Cool. You know, what type of support do they need in, in the transition? I mean, different organizations need different support. Um, so for instance, um, we're doing a project for one organization on inclusive language. So that is an element that, as Alex says, is around culture, really. Um, boundary setting is often one that's really important um, because obviously when you can work when and where you choose, you also need to be really good at setting boundaries. So training individuals in boundary setting is something we do and also remote leadership. So lots of organizations are still very much ingrained in traditional leadership methods when actually you really need to be leading in an appropriate way when you have a globally dispersed autonomous workforce. So those are the kind of three particular ones at the moment. I think I think that's part of a bigger challenge that people and organizations have right now, which is post pandemic, particularly, um, we have this kind of awareness of different potential ways of working, but actually none of the experience of having done it. Um, we can bring that experience and help people and organizations save a lot of time in the adoption of more autonomous ways of working. And that's really to help with this mindset transition that people are programmed to think of work a certain way. And that's anchored in hundreds, if not thousands of years of work being done a certain way. Mm -hmm. And what we need to realize is that we are now in a, in a digitally enabled moment in history that is entirely different from our past that predates it. And we need to reprogram the way we think about work in order to thrive and, and seize the opportunity that technology has put in front of us. Mm. Amen again. So yeah, I, I hope you you um, you felt I was trying a little bit to ask devil's advocate questions and using terms yeah. like talent acquisition, but it was really <laughs> tough because I think work style is a synonym synonym for embossers and 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 vice versa. So. Uh, I hope I did my yeah. best. Um, you tried. Uh, you tried. Yeah, I tried. I enjoyed tried. it. That was a great job. And, and, and I also also saw the similar triggers that I sometimes have uh, on these specific typical management words that just gets you. Yeah, it it puts you. <laughs> it triggers you, and then oh no, that's not what we mean. <laughs> They're funny. Um, yeah. Well, and also that people just don't understand. Like, uh, yeah. obviously, we don't use jargon. We don't. No one uses three-letter acronyms. You know, we just try and use simple language because it's the most accessible uh, way to work. You know. Uh, so you're you don't live in a VUCA world, and it's not. Uh, we have no ba town halls. What is that? Ba <laughs> Bani and. Uh, yeah. Okay, <laughs> let's uh, the final question, guys. What's the dream, and how can I and uh, our listeners help? So it won't surprise you to know that the dream is that everyone can work in a work style way, you know, um, whatever that might involve. And every person who works in a work style way on the journey to get there is a life that we've helped to improve. So for us, you know, each individual person that reads the book and adopts some of the principles of work style helps us to move in that direction. But that's the vision that one day everyone can work in a work style way. Okay, so um, and how makes... how can you help? Um, read the book, buy the book. Exactly. Yeah, so where Amazon. where can where can people buy it? All good bookshops. And All good bookshops and on Amazon. Yeah, get a copy yeah, of the Amazon. book. Um, visit workstarevolution.com and join the Workstar Revolution community as well. We're building a community of people who support the idea of workstyle and the idea of changing the way we work to be more like work style uh, so join that community with we're, we're talking about it all the time sharing resources and helping people with the the change of 
moving from traditional work to uh, autonomous work style work. Okay, great. Um, last question, one, one tiny question. Um, do you guys give like keynotes about work style or, or yes. uh, what if someone wants to yes, know more and, 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 and get in contact? So what's, yeah? If you yeah. go to workstylerevolution.com um, forward, slash, forward slash speaking or under the speaking tab, then you can see a little bit of Alex and I in action, um, a few testimonials, and it gives you the contact details um, for who to get in touch with to set up a talk. We love giving keynote speeches, as you can imagine, about work. I can imagine. I can imagine. Mm -hmm. I, 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 uh, you really see the 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 energy and the passion uh, on both of your faces uh, when you're when you're talking. It's really endearing to see. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks, Nick. Uh, Brilliant. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah. Thank you for thank having, you for having us. us. It's been loads thank of fun. You. Yeah. Thank, thank you. It. A pleasure. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers for now. Bye. I'll stop recording. <laughs>